Hey guys, it's Miko from ML Sound Lab once again. And today I want to talk about what makes an IR good. So um, there are so many IR producers out there these days and everyone is just saying that I have the best IRs and you should be using my product, which is a great marketing statement, but I don't really want to take that route. I want to explain to you what makes a good IR and why my IRs are the best ones on the market right now. So first, let's talk about what makes an IR. So essentially, an IR is modeling whatever happens after the amplifier in your guitar rig. So um, the cabinet and how it's being mic'd up. And that is actually like 90% of your guitar tone. It's actually kind of weird, but if you're using like a Mesa amp and a Marshall amp, and uh, it's going through the same cabinet with the same mic up, they're actually gonna sound pretty similar. So. You can do many things wrong when shooting an IR. Obviously, number one will be the microphone positioning. Um, most people uh, do it so that they have a live room and a control room and they move their mic with their hands and then go back to control room and check if it sounds good and so on. Uh, then there are some guys that uh, have headphones on and do the mic placements in the live room with the loud cabinet screaming in your face. I feel like both of those methods are wrong you don't really hear the mic position that great. So what I did was I built a microphone robot that I can control from my control room. So I'm just sitting on the computer, I have a camera on and I can see where the microphone is moving. And um, essentially what I do, I have a joystick and I just move the mic where I feel it sounds best and shoot an IR. So that's a huge advantage. Uh, I can really fine tune the microphone positioning that way. I don't have to run back and forth between the two rooms. Um, I just get exactly the mic positioning that I want and I shoot that IR. And with that, I shoot, for example, for the last cap pack I did ML USA Gent, I shot over a thousand IRs. And obviously the cap pack doesn't come with a thousand IRs, so we choose the best ones out of the fine-tuned ones that I made. Also, um, obviously the cabinet, the cabinet size, the speakers that are in there, super important. Uh, but how it's placed in the room and how you treat your room acoustically is super important. And I'm not going to tell you my secrets, but let's just say that I've studied this a lot. I've built my own acoustic panels. Um, maybe I lift the cabinet up a little bit. Maybe I don't. I'm not going to tell you. But experimenting with stuff like that really helps you get the best tone possible. Apart from just the mic placement, uh, a 4x12 cabinet has four speakers in it. Most IR producers only shoot one speaker of the 4x12 cabinet. Um, for me, that sounds lazy, super lazy. Uh, I shoot all four and I include them in the cap pack. You get four times the versatility. Um, and then when you start combining the different speakers with each other, I feel like it's like 100 times more versatility than just shooting one speaker on a 4x12 cabinet. After that, we need to discuss how the caps are being driven. So. I'm probably one of the only ones that uses real tube amplifiers to drive the cabinets. I feel like the cabinet needs to be driven exactly the same way as it would be driven in real life. So, um, for example, if you get Cap Pack 13 or ML USA Gent, those Cap Packs uh, are Mesa Cap Packs. They were both driven with a Mesa tube head, a Mark IV to be more specific. You may not know this, but most IR producers do not use real tube amplifiers to shoot their IRs. Uh, they use solid-state amplifiers or something completely different that is flat-ish. All of my IRs are being shot with tube amplifiers. The 4x12 caps, the smaller caps even are being driven with real amplifiers. The AC30 pack that I made was shot with a real old vintage AC30. And um, what I do is I remove that tube amp collar from the IRs in post. And this way I get the cleanest possible capture. Even if you're using like a solid state amplifier or something like that, that is flat-ish, you're not getting a clean capture if you're not removing your amp color. Uh, because also solid state amplifiers have their own color. It may be flat-ish, but it's not colorless. Ultimately, I have to say this. One of the most important parts of being a really good IR producer is that you know your stuff. So I'm a guitar player. I produce bands. I'm an audio engineer. I mix professional level uh, music. Um, I'm not the best guitar player, but I know my stuff. Um, I know how to sound good, all that stuff. So I know what I'm searching for when making an IR. 
And before I started doing these IRs, I was actually the match EQ geek. I'm not sure if you guys know this, but even before Kemper, even before XFX had tone matching, I was doing the match EQ thing, which is essentially what the Kemper does and what the tone matching does in the XFX. So anything from Jimi Hendrix to Bon Jovi uh, to Kill Switch Engage, I've gone through those uh, guitar tones that they're using on their albums and matched them. I really understand how they work, how they treat their low end, how they treat their high end, how much they scoop their amps and stuff like that. So with that knowledge, I kind of know how a professional would uh, place a microphone uh, and how it's been done in the past. That's kind of how I learned how to position microphones on a cabinet. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you liked it. I hope you learned something about IRs. If you have more questions, please ask. I'm more than happy to help. And uh, stay tuned and subscribe to my channel. I'm gonna be talking a lot about IRs and guitar tone in general. So cheers guys, subscribe, bye bye.